you, Chairman. Um, I have to, um, I wish that uh, some of our colleagues were still here. Uh, on this discussion about uh, guns illegally trafficked across the southern border to the cartels, there are solutions here, and they don't need to be partisan solutions. Uh, I wish our colleagues were here uh, for this conversation, but, uh, you know, listen, I know that our colleagues across the aisle are not going to support an assault weapons ban, are not going to support a high-capacity magazine ban. I support those things. They don't. Fine. Leave that conversation for another day. As Mr. Blazak has said, the issue here is firearms often being purchased legally and then trafficked to the cartels illegally. And there are things that we can do to crack down on that, like universal background checks, closing the gun show loophole so that when a gun is sold to an individual, wherever they are in whatever setting, there is a criminal background check to make sure that that firearm is not being sold to somebody with a record that suggests that they can't be trusted with it. Um, I have introduced a bill, or I'm introducing a bill soon, uh, to stiffen penalties for dealers that fail to conduct background checks that they are legally required to conduct. Because unfortunately, right now, under our current laws, and this is not the vast majority of gun shop owners, most of whom follow the law and do the right thing, but those that don't, when they knowingly fail to perform a background check, get a slap on the wrist over and over again. So there are things that are common sense, that ought to be bipartisan, that we ought to do, and we cannot minimize the fact that uh, the source of the power of these TCOs, of these cartels, is their ability to inflict acts of violence on people because they are heavily armed, and that is part of the equation. Uh, I also want to build off of something that Ms. Ford said uh, correctly when she was asked, correctly I believe, why are people coming here? And the obvious answer is, well, because they think they'll have an easy time getting across. One of the reasons that they think they have an easy time getting across is because the cartels and the traffickers are lying to them and telling them that U.S. asylum laws will let anybody come across and have an easy time getting asylum, getting a green card, whatever the case may be. And so, again, one of the remedies to this is let people apply for asylum at U.S. consulates or from their home countries so that they can see whether they are eligible or not. And when people see themselves that they're not eligible, they'll be less likely to believe the lies that the cartels are telling them and make that dangerous, often deadly journey. So again, there are things here that ought to be common sense, bipartisan solutions, and I do hope that's the direction. Will the gentleman go. yield? And I'll, I'll, I'll give you additional time. Sure. Is that not currently happening, where you can apply for asylum at U.S. consulates? Is that not the standard protocol? I mean, my, my understanding is that the legislation that, that the House just passed uh, restricts the ability of people to use the CBP-1 app to get applications to have their asylum claims considered, that uh, the number of uh, places in other countries where people can apply for asylum in person is limited. And again, I think under the current administration, some of those policies are changing. I think that's a positive thing. But I do think that needs to be part of the conversation. We need to make it harder for the cartels to lie to people about their eligibility. Yeah, I just, I think we need to check that, you know, the specificity of that particular uh, asylum. Uh, when, when you're seeking asylum and doing it in another country, I think is, is pretty much standard protocol uh, that, that happens. And I'm not sure that the, the law has been changed to reflect uh, any difference. You still have two minutes left, so I yield back. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right, switching gears here. Um, we focus most of our attention today on uh, Mexican, Central American, South American TCOs, and rightfully so, because I think we all are in agreement that those are the TCOs that pose the most immediate risks to the homeland and to our citizens. Uh, but there are other groups out there, some of which are operating in the United States that are dangerous, and I believe Mr. Farah and others have mentioned them. Um, ISIS, uh, the Iranian transnational uh, network, um, can we just, and I'll open it up to any of you with my last couple of minutes here, would anyone like to spend a little more time highlighting the risks posed by some of those organizations and what we as policymakers should do to crack down on them? 
Well, I think one of the real issues that we're seeing across the region is not just the traditional like Hezbollah threat network, Iranian threat network, is the Albanian mafia is now there. There are multiple uh, parts of the Italian mafia structures now plugging in because the markets, the cocaine market is shifting while our synthetic market here is rising. So the cocaine market in Europe and Russia, former Soviet uh, Republics is much more lucrative than it is in the United States, and our cocaine consumption has been down while our synthetic consumption has been way up. So I think that there are numerous new types of violence being introduced, numerous new types of money laundering being introduced, numerous new types of trafficking structures are being introduced that introduce these groups that have been in this hemisphere to a whole new set of African, European, Asian, and, uh, and uh, former Soviet Republic structures that allow everyone to make a lot more money and make it much more difficult for us to crack down. There's one case I'm sure Mr. Irvin's familiar with, the, the case of the Guyane, which is a ship that ended up being busted in Philadelphia with 17 tons. That was, uh, those were Eastern European crews loading off the coast of Chile, passing through with a different group that, uh, that switched, that loaded the cocaine in the Panama Canal, then moved, to, uh, then moved to Philadelphia. It was all external actors in a 17-ton cocaine shipment of uh, which was busted almost by luck in, in Philadelphia. So I think that's the issue. Yeah. Would anyone else like to weigh in on uh, any other TCOs that we should be focused on as well as a committee? And again, ISIS, Iran. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Blazakis. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, I'll just say on the uh, ISIS front, um, I think it's particularly important that we keep our eye on Afghanistan. We've had um, multiple senior officials within the Biden administration speak with um, great alarm regarding a possible resurgence of the so-called ISIS Khorasan province in Afghanistan, um, so much to the point where um, the administration said that they worry about that group having the external um, operations capability within six months. And that statement was from a senior Department of Defense official about three months ago. So I think it's particularly important that we continue to invest uh, some level of resources as it relates to tracking ISIS um, Khorasan in Afghanistan, especially. Thank you all. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair now recognizes.